If you want to see an extended, entirely ad-free version of this video, I want to remind you about our wonderful members-only community, The Society at TFD, available here on YouTube or over on Patreon. The membership is exactly the same on both platforms, so you can join through whichever platform you prefer. If you want to support us here at TFD, joining our members-only community is the best way to do that. Members get early access to the ad-free extended director's cut of this video you're about to watch, as well as access to 20-plus ad-free bonus videos, monthly workshops, our Discord community, our book club, and more when you join. Again, you can join here on YouTube, or you can join on patreon.com slash financial diet and join at the $4.99 level. As many of you know, we are a completely independent women-owned and run small business, and our 2024 goal is to become primarily supported by our incredible community. We love you guys, whether or not you join the society, but it'd be a lot cooler if you did. I feel like a lot of the parenting content that I was seeing fell into one of two camps. There was the kind of like mid to late 2000s mommy blogger camp, which was I am perfect and my children are perfect and my home is perfect and the organic bento box lunches I pack every day are perfect. And then there was this other like mommy wine time. My husband is basically a giant toddler. Um, everything about being parents is terrible. Like there was kind of this, you do this, then you have to be perfect or you're doing it wrong. Or these people who just monetize all the hard parts and never talk about the fun parts. It felt like those were the only two options. Like those are the only two ways to be a parent because those were the only portrayals that you saw consistently in the spaces where I was consuming content. Welcome everyone to this month's video essay. And as you might've been able to tell from the title and thumbnail of this one, we're gonna be talking about one of the more underrated industries that my generation has left for dead on the side of the road, and that is the having kids industry. Basically, if you've looked almost anywhere in the news over the past decade, you've probably seen doomsday headlines like these that not only point out the fact that younger people are just not having as many kids, but always doing what the news media does best when it comes to talking about millennials and Gen Z, which is making it entirely our fault and indicative of an inherent moral failure. And this is a topic that I've been wanting to cover for a long time because as many, if not most of you probably know, I am personally someone who identifies as child-free by choice, though you can also just refer to me as a childless old hag or whatever term feels good for you. But you may not know, although some people occasionally point this out to me in the comments of my videos as a kind of gotcha moment, I didn't always not want kids. In fact, in my very first book, I'm Only Here for the Wi-Fi, I actually talked kind of at length about the fact that I expected one day to have children. I also talked about it in articles that I posted on the internet around that time and didn't really come into the secure decision with my husband that it wasn't the right choice for us until at least my mid to late 20s. Now, I don't personally look at the fact that I used to think I wanna have kids and now don't as some kind of gotcha because first of all, I contain multitudes even on a day-to-day -day basis, let alone over the span of 12 plus years. But I do think it's always worth noting why I personally came to the decision that having kids wasn't right for me. And we'll also be speaking to someone in this video who did change their mind in the other direction, just for reference. But for me, when it comes down to it, although I do love children, I don't think that I am personally very adapted on a personality, interest, patience, or just vibes level to being a parent. I'm much better suited to having different kinds of relationships with the kids in my life. But also the things that I most value in my life, my freedom, my flexibility, my ability to take on various hobbies and projects, travel, professional challenges, and other things that take up quite a lot of my life. And similarly for my husband, he's very much like that as well. I simply think that being a full-time parent would come at too much of an expense of those things that it would probably be very unpleasant. I do genuinely think that if I were to have kids, if I were, let's say, born in a generation where that was really not a choice for me, or given what's happening in this country, lived in a state where it's not a choice for me, I might end up being one of those parents who regrets having kids because it's a lot more common than we think. Just check the number of people subscribed to the Regretful Parents subreddit. Either way, not having children was a decision that I reached over several years and for many reasons. And more than anything, I feel very grateful to live in a time where that is a choice that's available to me and not something I have to be particularly ashamed of, even if certain extended family members wish otherwise. Because let's be clear, I think the world is infinitely better when people are able to proactively choose parenthood and to opt out of it when it's not meant for them, and more people should be able to make that choice. Introduction. The Child Free by Choice Movement, when you could have kids, but don't want to. 
So let's start by looking at what the child-free community even is. While the term child-free was first used at the turn of the last century, it came into common use by feminists in roughly the 1970s. But as a sociological trend, it really started to pick up steam in the past two decades, with a Psychology Today article highlighting it as an emerging trend back in 2014. An auspicious year, also the one in which I founded The Financial Diet. And speaking as someone in the community, I've definitely noticed anecdotally a decrease in stigma and increase in normalization, and this does seem supported by the data, which we'll get into. But it's still worth noting that despite despite the increase in not having children as a proactive choice, even among the dreaded millennial generation, on average, people still do want kids and do end up having them. Speaking personally, I am a coastal elite in her mid-30s living in New York City and working in media, and yet still almost every single one of my girlfriends either has children, is in the process of having them, or plans to have them. Fox News would have a field day with my lifestyle choices, and yet I'm largely surrounded by normies doing normie things, including having normie babies. So if that's my case, I can only imagine what's happening in the Midwest. Now, I am just one child-free girly pop, but it was important to me to speak with someone who is open about their decision online as well, and who did it slightly before it even became a trend. So I sat down with TikTok mutual, internet friend, and simply one of the chicest women on TikTok, Dominique Baker. Uh, my name is Dominique Baker, and I'm 46 years old. And when I turned 29, I made the decision uh, to officially be child free. I had gotten married about three years prior, and I thought, you know, I better make the decision. I, I better uh, speak to my husband and find out if he wants to be child free as well. There was no tipping point, there was no, you know, switch that had been flipped. I kind of always knew that I didn't want to have kids. But at that period of my life, I was just like, I, I, I think it's official. I'm not going to be a mother. And that was that I sat down my husband and I had a frank discussion with him. Thankfully, he was on the same page. I wouldn't recommend anybody do that. Get married, then <laughs> make the decision uh, or informing your partner that you want to be child free. But I sensed that he was on the same page as well. My mom and dad were a little disappointed. My dad, of course, threw around the whole, what about my own legacy? Uh, he was worried that none of his, uh, none of his three daughters would have kids. And then he just sort of never really spoke about it ever again. Um, my mother, my mother was sad. She definitely wanted grandkids, but you know, part of my decision over the years was that like, that helped me make my child free decision was watching them struggle to raise the three of us. Now, we never wanted for anything, but we I, I knew even as a kid that we didn't have that much money. I was not like my classmates, you know, their parents having renovations done to their houses constantly or going to Disneyland every year, buying new cars all the time. We weren't like that whatsoever. But um we wanted for nothing, but at various points of my parents' lives, they worked two jobs to make ends meet. Um, I wanted a little bit more for myself. We also never traveled when I was younger. We would do the occasional road trip to Philadelphia to see my grandparents, but I always had this wanderlust being a Sagittarian, and I wanted to travel the world, frankly, securing my career, building a strong career, traveling the world, and continuing my education at the time were more important to me than settling down and having kids. But where these doomsday headlines are not totally wrong is that there is some data on people having fewer children. Quote, birth rates are falling in the US. After the highs of the baby boom in the mid 20th century and the lows of the baby bust in the 1970s, birth rates were relatively stable for nearly 50 years. But during the Great Recession from 2007 to 2009, birth rates declined sharply, and they've kept falling. In 2007, average birth rates were right around two children per woman. By 2021, levels had dropped more than 20%, close to the lowest level in a century. Why? In part, this decline is good news. There are fewer unintended births than there were 30 years ago, a decrease linked to increasing use of effective contraceptive methods like IUDs and implants, and improved insurance coverage from the Affordable Care Act. Also, compared with earlier eras, people today start having their children later. These delays also contribute to declining birth rates. Because people start having them later, they have less time to meet their childbearing goals before they reach biological or social age limits for having kids. 
As people wait longer to start having children, they are also more likely to change their minds about parenting. Bitch, we're just getting tired. Like here in New York City, it is not at all uncommon to see women in their 40s and beyond like having twins on a moment's notice and you're just like, girl, I can't even have a dinner on a moment's notice. And there's definitely a level of increasing intentionality around the idea of being child-free by choice. A 2021 poll by Pew Research found that 44% of childless adults said they're unlikely to have children, up sharply from 37%. Add to that the already established trend of families getting smaller, so even when women are having kids, they're having fewer of them. I truly believe in North America, the goal is to be a mom and have kids, like this whole nuclear family of, you know, husband, wife, beautiful single family home, like really cool SUV to cart your kids around, uh, the golden retriever, the two perfect kids, blah, blah, blah. Like that cookie cutter lifestyle is the goal. It has been pushed on us our entire lives. I don't see this whatsoever when I go to Europe. I don't see this whatsoever when I am speaking to most of my family that still lives in England. I think it's really pushed in North American society, in the media, the whole nine yards that if you don't have a mom, if you don't have the perfect good looking husband, if you don't get the cool car and the nice stroller and have the two perfect kids and the dog, like you are less than. I think that's been shoved down our throats by North American society for decades. To get a deeper dive, we wanted to sit down with the woman who literally wrote the book Child Free by Choice, sociology professor Amy Blackstone. We saw during the feminist backlash of the 1980s that one way that conservatives saw to push against the feminist movement and to kind of keep women in their place was to develop this idea of intensive mothering and um, to sort of develop motherhood as uh, this thing that people could and should become experts in and to pressure women to do and be everything for their children. So um, that's when the concept of helicopter parenting emerged. And uh, if, and, you know, so we, we started to think at that time, oh, well, good mothers are mothers who um, always cook for their families and spend time cooking only the best and the most healthy uh, meals for their family, which takes a lot of time and costs a lot of money. Good mothers are mothers who enroll their kids in all kinds of activities, which also costs a lot of money. Good mothers are mothers who spend all kinds of time finding the best and most expensive private schools for their children. That costs a lot of money. Um, good mothers are mothers who um, enroll in classes to learn how to be good mothers. Uh, so again, becoming an expert mother um, becoming a good mother means becoming an expert mother, which means um, spending all kinds of mother money to become an expert mother. Now, I mentioned earlier that I used to want children and then pivoted to not wanting them definitively, but I did want to speak to someone who made the opposite transition. So we sat down with Maggie Olson Taylor, a former contributor to TFD, who used to be child free by choice and then later decided she wanted children. Yeah, so there are a couple of different factors that. Um led to me changing my mind. I didn't want to have kids for probably 10 years. I was totally sure I didn't want them. I was like, I'm not interested. It's not my thing. Um, and then I went through a two or three year period where I was like, well, I don't know, maybe. And then ultimately decided like, yeah, I do want to have a baby. So um, there were a couple of things that changed for me. One of the biggest factors was I, as the person I chose to marry, um, I think there is a lot of internet content out there about people like women especially who will have a baby and then their husband like doesn't really pull his weight and doesn't really help up with the baby and I find that content like very stressful um and have a lot of anxiety about like what if I have a baby with someone who just doesn't help out and then when I married someone who made it really clear that he was super excited to participate in all the baby care and really be a hands-on parent a lot of those anxieties for me really went away um and I felt more confident about the fact that we would have like two people participating in raising this child. One of the examples I love to give about having a hands-on partner is that I did not change a diaper for the first three days of my son's life. My husband did all of them. So he really took over um, like the minute Teddy was born. Um, he was already like 
playing a huge role in like raising our son. He didn't kind of let it all fall to me. So for me, marrying the right person made a huge difference in how I felt about having a child and then just like wanting to share that experience with him. I am one of three kids. My husband is one of three kids. All my cousins have siblings. I grew up around a lot of people with siblings. I didn't really feel like having just one child was an option for whatever reason, because I just wasn't around a lot of only children. But as I got older and kind of met more only children and started thinking more from that perspective, the idea of just having one child felt right to me. I never could get excited about multiple children. But once I thought, oh, I could just have one, then I was able to get really excited about it. Now, I listed just some of my personal reasons for not wanting kids, but it's important to note that the reasons for not having children tend to be as diverse as the reasons for having them. Which brings us to chapter one, a brief history of reasons for being child-free. Now, while there are basically endless reasons why someone might choose not to have kids, some are more documented than others. Now, climate change is often cited as a big reason for not wanting children, and I did happen to sit down for an episode of TFC this season with a woman who is both a climate journalist and extremely concerned about climate change, but also a mother about the philosophy of her choice. But for many people, climate change, both the future it represents and the climate impact of having children, especially in the West, is a big reason people cite for not having them. Quote, but new research has found many people are now basing their decisions to not have children on their fears of climate breakdown. The study by a team of academics at the University College of London is believed to be the first systematic review to explain how and why climate-related concerns may be affecting reproductive decision-making. Their analysis found that in 12 of 13 studies, stronger concerns about climate breakdown were associated with a desire for fewer children or none at all. And it wouldn't be the financial diet if we did not acknowledge that the economy and cost of living are also one of by far the biggest reasons why people are not having children, even if in many cases they would like to or would like more of them. And we will break this down in a whole other chapter. But just as a top line note, quote, in fact, 2020 was the sixth straight year of fewer new babies in the US and Americans' reasons for putting off children or not having them at all are complicated. But there's growing recognition of the role that money plays. Nearly three in five millennials without children say they don't have any because kids are just too expensive. Another common reason is not wanting to repeat experiences from a bad childhood. There's less data or research on on this, but there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that at least a faction of people choose not to have children because of their own childhood experiences. Quote, enduring and overcoming childhood trauma is a huge reason why people choose not to have children, explains behavioral health specialist Dr. Larry Ford. Individuals who suffered from childhood trauma, such as neglect, abuse, abandonment, and living with the reality of an incarcerated parent, among others, don't feel equipped to raise a child of their own. Patients are still working out their own emotional and physical pain, and they don't want to pass that on to a child. And especially for women, wanting to progress in their careers is a big factor in deciding to be child-free, or at least delaying having children. According to a 2022 survey from ResumeBuilder.com, 33% of women who have children and or are currently pregnant say having children has had a negative impact on their own career. And women's labor participation hit a 30-year low in 2023, likely due to some lasting effects of the pandemic, where we saw more women taking on the role of stay-at-home parent or homeschooler than their male counterparts. I couldn't get excited about the idea of having a child. I don't know if there was any one thing. I just, there was nothing about it that like sounded fun to me. Um, and looking back on that, I think a lot of it was a product of the way that parenthood is talked about on the internet and in social media in particular. Um, I was in late high school when I first joined Facebook. So when I was coming of age and coming to the time in life when you're starting to think about what you want out of your future family, I was really heavily immersed in social media. And I feel like a lot of the parenting content that I was seeing fell into one of two camps. There was the kind of like, mid to late 2000s mommy blogger camp, which was I am perfect and my children are perfect and my home is perfect and the organic bento box lunches I pack every day are perfect. And then there was this other like mommy wine time. My husband is basically a giant toddler. Um, everything about being parents is terrible. Like there was kind of this, you do this, then you have to be perfect or you're doing it wrong. Or these people who just monetize all the hard parts and never talk about the fun parts. It felt like those were the only two options. Like those are the only two ways to be a parent because those were the only portrayals that you saw consistently in the spaces where I was consuming content. So 
neither of those sounded like fun choices to me. I wasn't interested in being perfect. I wasn't interested in following this path where you act like the only way to tolerate parenthood is to engage in like mild substance abuse. So I just like wasn't seeing anything that was compelling to me. And I didn't really have any other real examples of parenthood available to me. So based on what I was seeing portrayed in media, I was like, this isn't anything I want. And there are countless more reasons that people often cite for not having kids, including the very popular, they just simply don't want them. Which according to a Pew Research study is the common response of 56% of people without children. I know that a lot of black women are single moms. Uh, there's a lot of fatherless children out there in our community. I didn't want that for my kids. Now, I, I, I'm not saying, that, you know, I'm not making a sweeping generalization. I think black women have it hard enough, but, uh, I was lucky to find my husband. I sat beside him in the second grade. Uh, I sat behind him. Actually, I got in trouble for reaching out and touching his hair. Cause I'd never seen such white hair in my life, white blonde hair. And I've been with him ever since I was 15. We broke up a couple of times in university, but I I don't know, if I were single, I didn't want to risk. It was important to me to have a strong family unit if I wanted to become a mom. And I didn't want to risk having kids, getting divorced, being single, really struggling to raise my kids. I think a lot of Black single moms, it's, it's dually hard for them because we have all the sort of racist hurdles that we need to get over. Um, a lot of us, you know, have troubles finding a partner who is worthy of us, who will prove to be a worthy dad. It was important to me to um, lead a life that meant a lot to me, lead a life that if I so choose to have kids, they're well taken care of, and to be supported by a partner who's worthy of me and my kids. Now, regardless of people's reasons for not having children, the underlying sentiment in so much of the fear-mongering around the fact that people aren't having them is that they really should be. And some of the same forces in our culture and society who are most invested in people having children are least invested in creating structures where people might be able to do so. In fact, one very underrated systemic issue around people not having kids is just how little help there tends to be. Which brings us to chapter two. The village, then versus now. You've probably heard the expression that it takes a village to raise a child, and this expression did not come from nowhere. Not only is it very literally true that the nuclear family is a really, really difficult structure for taking on the exclusive burden of raising a family, it's also very historically uncommon. Now, there are some clear differences in what kinds of support is available to parents in the US between now and a few decades ago, both for better and for worse. For instance, I'm sure we're all aware of the dismal state of parental leave in the US, but it actually used to be even worse, if you can believe it. Maternity leave is not federally mandated, but it is required by some states, and that is still fairly new, which is obviously a positive change. Quote, no US federal law provides a right to paid family or medical leave. However, important proposals have been advanced, such as one that passed in the US House of Representatives as part of the Build Back Better Act and the Family and Medical Insurance Leave Family Act, which has been revised and reintroduced for the 118th Congress. 13 states have passed family and medical leave laws, including California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Maine, Massachusetts, Maryland, Minnesota, New Jersey, New York, Oregon, Rhode Island, and Washington State, as well as Washington, D.C. Unlike the states listed above, New Hampshire and Vermont do not legally guarantee workers the right to paid leave. They only provide a voluntary opportunity to purchase insurance coverage. Now, none of this is to say that we are anywhere near what we should be compared to other countries. Most states that offer family leave allow up to 12 weeks in a 12-month period, with varying additional allowances for disability leave. But this almost world-unique lack of support around leave and recovery time for new parents is even worse when you consider just how little support is around those same new parents. In the United States, we have very few supports for parents, for people who want to become parents. Uh, it's a darn expensive thing here in this country. If you compare the U.S. to other Western nations, uh, we are just about the worst in terms of supporting parenthood. We have terrible uh, parental leave policies. So for parents who work, it's almost impossible to take time off to spend time rearing your kids. You got to keep working um, and find a way for your kid to get care. Usually that means daycare. There's another cost. Um, so uh, 
which contributes to the rising cost. That's not to say that dare care providers are paid what they're worth, but it is an expense that parents often pay because employers and the government aren't going to pay it. Um, we've all heard about rising health care costs. So adding another member of your family also means not contributing to their health care costs as well. So there are all kinds of places um, where we see the costs of rearing kids rising. While we may have at least some parental leave now, depending on what state you live in or what company you work for, it also used to be much more feasible to support a family on just one income. In the early to mid 20th century, the American economy and individual workplaces were designed with one major assumption in mind. The American family unit included a working father and a stay-at-home mother. Women entering the workforce en masse starting around the 1970s was a result of the women's liberation movement, yes, but it was also an economic necessity for many families due to inflation. Not only is the extremely isolated nuclear family model not optimal for raising kids, even that previous village of one parent always being in the home for the most part has all but evaporated. And it's difficult for so many millennials especially to imagine themselves having kids because they're still treated like kids themselves, because so many of them can't afford to live the way adults are supposed to. Quote, young adults, many burdened by financial struggles, are now living with their folks at a higher rate than people of their age did 50 years ago. The proportion of young adults who live in a parent's home more than doubled between 1971 and 2021 from 8 to 17%, according to a recent Pew Research report. And as we've discussed a lot on this channel, buying a home is becoming less and less of a reality, especially for younger generations. From a study from former real estate brokerage firm HomeBay, buying a home should cost about 2.6 times what the average American makes in a year. In reality, it costs 5.8 times the median household income, making home ownership an increasingly elusive dream for today's home buyers. If home prices had grown at the same rate as income since 2000, the median US home price would cost nearly 294,000, about 32% less than today's price of 433. And as parents are stretched more and more thin with less and less support, both institutionally and personally, childcare costs are increasing at about twice the rate of inflation. Ask any parent in your life, and believe me, I do because I find this situation wild. And the numbers people will throw at you on what it costs to keep your kid in childcare sound honestly fake. In some instances, childcare literally costs more than college tuition. Quote, around 47% of parents spend up to $18,000 a year on their childcare expenses, according to a new cost of care report from care.com, while 20% of parents indicated they spend more than $36,000 in a year. And the data shows that childcare is incredibly more expensive than when our parents were being raised, even when adjusting for inflation. Quote, the cost of childcare has increased 220% in the last three decades, according to Lisa Hamilton, president of the Annie E. Casey Foundation, which since 1990 has tracked this and other issues around child well being in an annual Kids Count report. The organization's 2023 report, released in June, found that 13% of children under the age of five live in a household where caregivers had to make job changes because of childcare issues. Five years ago, that number was 9%. The report also found more than half of working parents with infants or toddlers reported having been late to work or leaving early in the previous three months due to childcare issues, and 23% reported being fired for it. The topic of child care and how expensive it can be is pretty common in the TFD office. So I pulled in my longtime coworker, Rachel, who has been navigating child care in New York City for years to speak a little bit on the topic. Now, especially in New York City, there's like pressure to put your kids in some sort of like daycare that is kind of like schooling where they're learning like what they would learn in like kindergarten or first grade as early as like two years old. In New York City, it's like pretty standard if you send your kid to full-time daycare, meaning like 8, 8.30 a.m. to like 3 p.m. is a full day. And then anything after that, say like 3 to 5.30 or 6 is like considered extended care. So for like 8 to 3, 5 days a week, like around 30 to $35,000 is pretty standard. And like I was a little surprised. I didn't realize it was going to be that high. But then once we decided to make the decision to do it, when I would speak to other parents, they'd be like, oh yeah, like I'm paying, you know, 40,000 or like you're getting a a deal in some ways. When I first started looking into childcare options for our family, I wondered how the hell like normal people afford this. Obviously in New York City, there's people with tons of wealth, but even so, if you make $100,000 a year and maybe you take home like 60 to 70,000 of that, 
you're still for daycare that costs like 30 to $35,000 a year, you're paying that out of pocket. And so you get to a place where you sort of wonder like, does one of us stay home? Because it's not worth the cost. Like it would be cheaper to like maybe have one parent home that like takes care of the kid full time and like live on one salary. Like that's definitely part of the conversation that happens when you're deciding, you know, can you afford this childcare or is it worth it? Neither me or my husband like wanted to be stay at home parents. And so we started my son in like three days a week. He never got acclimated. So we moved him to five days and my parents offered to help pay like 25% just to like take a bit of the burden off of mine and my husband's shoulders. And so like, I know not everyone has that situation or that privilege, but had I not had that, like I think we'd maybe be having a different conversation that has taken like a huge burden off of it for us. I think people are really struggling. If you're not like, a, you know, like a seven figure family, which like there's a bunch of articles and, you know, studies about this, like in New York City, if you're a family, like a, a dual income household and you make less than $300,000, paying for childcare is a struggle just based on what the, you know, standard cost is. And so we're able to afford it because we get help. And I'm grateful for that because otherwise, you know, that's it's a substantial amount of, of money every year coming out of our income. Hey, it's me from the future. And I'm here with a quick little ad break because I'd like to take a second to thank this video's sponsor, Rocket Money. Without regularly auditing our spending, a lot of less than ideal purchases can easily fly under the radar. For instance, I recently had to confront just how much I was spending on takeout thanks to a month long no restaurant spending challenge. And most Americans probably don't realize that we are spending on average over $200 a month on subscriptions. But luckily today's sponsor, Rocket Money, is here to help. Rocket Money is the personal finance app that helps you lower your bills and manage your money better. It can safely and securely identify recurring charges and cancel unwanted subscriptions for you. You can even easily cancel from within the app, no wasting time calling customer service. Rocket Money can also analyze your spending habits to create a custom budget that works with your lifestyle. Automatically monitor your spending by category and get notifications for when you've exceeded your limits. Rocket Money has helped save its customers up to $740 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. Go to rocketmoney.com TFD or click the link in the description to get started for free. You can also unlock even more features with premium. That's rocketmoney.com TFD to get started for free. One category of expenses that have been more significant than I expected was the cost of breastfeeding. So my child is exclusively breastfed. He's three and a half months old. And, you know, you hear breast is free because it doesn't cost money the way formula does. But I have also spent a lot of money on nipple cream and nursing bras and nursing sweatshirts and pads to put in my bra so that I don't leak milk everywhere. And also I'm doing a ton of laundry because I'm constantly soaking through bras. So I have been surprised by the fact that even though the product itself is free, the accessories that are necessary, well, not necessary, the accessories that I have chosen to invest in for the sake of breastfeeding cost money. On top of that, if you were to put a dollar amount on my time and the amount of time I spend breastfeeding, it would be astronomical. So I spend probably 24 hours a week breastfeeding or doing something related to breastfeeding, whether that's pumping, getting ready to breastfeed, burping my baby, whatever. If I were to put a dollar amount on that based on what I charge per hour as a freelancer, it would cost more than I actually earn as a freelancer. It's, it's a, the time cost of breastfeeding is significant in a way that I don't think I fully realized until I was doing it. I think the biggest benefits for me are our time and resources. So I know that there are plenty of parents out there uh, who have the wherewithal to live a fabulous life and be great parents, but I don't see too many of those around. And I feel that a lot of women especially put their lives on hold to become mothers. And then when they're in the throes of it, there's a little regret. I've spoken to many a mom who wish that either they had waited or that they didn't have kids. 
And I just didn't want that for myself. Uh, as a Black woman, I am more than aware that family, like that nuclear family unit that we are all so used to in North America is incredibly important. And it's frankly a goal that many of us Black women strive for or strive towards. But I just, I didn't want that for myself. I feel like I have no biological clock. I wanted to be able to have enough money to travel the world and to live the life that I sort of wanted to live. I didn't want to struggle like my parents did. And while it was traditionally very common for the village to include, let's say, older family members who step in and help care for children, and that is still the case for some families, Increasingly, older generations are having to work themselves well past retirement age. Combine that with people having to move far from their homes to find better employment options, and the village we used to depend on for raising children has essentially evaporated, and like so many other things over the past few decades, become a luxury item that only the wealthy can truly afford. And what really sucks is that we've seen how much of a difference emergency measures can make in families' financial stability, but our government is never willing to make these changes permanent. The expanded child tax credit immensely helped families during COVID, but after its lapse, the rate of children in the U.S. living in poverty went from 5.2% in 2021 to 12.4% in 2022, more than doubling. To me, what the data makes clear is that even for people who want to have children, we've done basically everything we can to abandon them and make it as difficult and expensive as possible. And this is all the more baffling when you consider chapter three, the societal level implications of people not having kids. Now, as someone who is a massive fan of the, in my opinion, still criminally underrated 2006 Clive Owen film, Children of Men, I know more than most how scary it can be when a population stops having kids entirely. Now, obviously that's a joke, that's an extreme example, but I should say up front in this chapter that it's sort of a mixed bag when it comes to a society having fewer children. But as I mentioned earlier, what's really baffling to me is how much, again, the people in our society who are most invested in people having more children are least invested in making it easy. The people who are mostly the re religious right and conservatives who hound people about having kids and pressure people to have kids are placing their emphasis in the wrong place. Um, they're pressuring people who say they don't wanna have kids to have them anyway, um, rather than looking at and listening to the people who are saying they don't want to have kids and, and finding ways to form policy that would support these people rather than taking away their rights, rather than taking away birth control, rather than removing the right to abortion, rather than limiting immigration, which is one way that we could increase our population. Um, they could be actually listening to the people who aren't having kids who are saying, hey, it's expensive to rear a kid. Hey, I'm not getting any support when I do. Um, they, could, they could take an approach to say, hey, how can we support you in this endeavor? Um, and they're not doing that. So, you know, it's hard to prove a counterfactual. I don't know what would happen, um, but we could look to nations where it is happening. Um, and we know from research where it's happening um, in Scandinavian countries where, where childcare is free and where parental leave policies are being offered. Uh, yes, uh, fertility is low there, um, but we do know that parents are happier. <laughs> so at the very least, uh, we, we could be happier. <laughs> but let's just talk a little bit about some of the actual possible outcomes of a society having fewer and fewer children. Japan is facing a demographic crisis. 43% of cities are losing population. The birth rate is far below the rate of 2.1 per woman needed for a steady population. The current global population is nearly 8 billion. Times are seeming to be a lot more difficult. Take South Korea, for instance, which is faced with the world's lowest fertility rate. Slay. <laughs> 
Quote, the number of babies expected per woman probably dropped this year to 0.72% and will continue to fall through 2025 when it's expected to reach 0.65%. South Korea already had the world's lowest fertility rate at 0.78% as of 2022, and the latest forecast by Statistics Korea puts the population in 2072 at 36.2 million, a 30% decline from the current 51.7 million, even though the fertility rate may recover a bit to 0.68 in 2026. The population is expected to fall every year starting in 2025. And South Korea is faced with a particularly difficult situation from a security standpoint. Low fertility threatens to undermine South Korea's economic future by shrinking its workforce and slowing consumption. It also casts a long shadow over national security by reducing the pool of men available to join the military to counter threats from North Korea. And experts have pointed to various reasons for South Korea's declining fertility rates, including rising cost of living and childcare and increased tensions between genders. But aside from concerns like national security, you may be wondering why a shrinking population could possibly be a negative thing, right? There are already so many people on the earth as it is. But there are many valid concerns when it comes to caring for aging populations if they're not being replaced with at least a one-to-one -one ratio of young people. From a New York Times opinion column, Quote, for many futurists, the primary challenge posed by declining population growth is economic. When people live longer and have fewer babies, the population ages, leaving fewer working age adults to support a country's swelling number of retirees. Aging might take a particularly heavy toll on middle income countries. Historically, as industrialized countries have become richer, the labor force grew more rapidly than their non-working population, providing a demographic dividend. But in some developing countries, including Brazil and China, fertility rates have fallen to around or below replacement level much more quickly than they did for their higher income counterparts, and their populations now face the risk of getting old before getting rich. Now, on the other hand, there are certainly arguments to be made that a declining population could be a positive thing for people and the planet that we live on. From the same New York Times opinion piece, fertility rate declines may also be making climate change easier to combat, albeit not in the way many think. As Sarah Kaplan of the Washington Post has explained, fossil fuel consumption is driven primarily by increases in affluence, not the number of people on the planet per se. So while population growth in poor countries hasn't led to large increases in planet warming emissions, a sudden baby boom in high-income countries like the United States almost certainly would. And while most of the concerns about population decline are based on the economy or national security, from an article in Scientific American, quote, for those more worried about economics than life on Earth, the World Bank estimates that the ecosystem collapse could cost $2.7 trillion a year by 2030. Deloitte recently estimated climate chaos could cost the United States alone $14.5 trillion by 2070 as we respond to the increasingly frequent and intense damage caused by extreme weather and wildfires, and threats to communities, farms, and businesses from droughts and unpredictable weather. While many assume population decline would inevitably harm the economy, researchers found that lower fertility rates would not only result in lower emissions by 2055, but a per capita income increase of 10%. And we also can't talk about declining birth rates in the US and their broader effects without talking about abortion. Now, first and foremost, reproductive rights are a crucial part of this conversation and also a deeply financial issue. Quote, carrying an unwanted pregnancy quadruples the odds that a woman and her child will live below the federal poverty line. According to the Turnaway Study, a University of California San Francisco research project that tracked women who get access to abortions versus those who'd been denied them over a 10 year period. It also triples the chances of the woman being unemployed. Yet we're already seeing reports of states with abortion bans seeing increased birth rates, and I would bet that we'll see plenty of conservative pundits pointing to this as a positive for the future. If abortion bans are putting more and more people into poverty, especially in states with the worst healthcare and parental leave policies, can this actually be seen as a net good? This correspondent says no. But if you think about the corporate magnates who benefit from keeping an entire class of workers in perpetual poverty, I mean, it might be a slay. The point is, while declining populations are a mixed bag, on the extreme end, there can obviously be massive issues, but the goal should be a healthy, sustainable population where no one is having to exist in a constant state of suffering in order to support the overall structure. Like if keeping the population growing comes at the cost of millions more children each year living in poverty, I don't necessarily know that's a trade-off we wanna make. Which brings us to chapter four. The elephant in the room, how difficult it can be to actually have children.
Now, setting aside all that we discussed in chapter two about some of the structural, societal, or familial barriers in having kids, there are also the very real physical limitations that a lot of people experience, especially when you consider hopeful parents who aren't even in hetero relationships. So how many people are child-free not by choice? Obviously, there are all of the reasons that we previously discussed, but among child-free adults, quote, about two in 10 say that it's due to medical reasons. The data doesn't specify what medical reasons encompass, but we can reasonably assume that at least some of those respondents are referring to issues getting pregnant. And according to a 2023 report from the World Health Organization, quote, around 17.5% of the adult population, roughly one in six worldwide, experience infertility, showing the urgent need to increase access to affordable, high quality fertility care for those in need. And there are many medical conditions that are shown to cause infertility. The list is too long to cover completely here, but it really covers everything, including STIs, eating disorders, substance use disorder, endometriosis, PCOS, thyroid disease, and many more. You never know when people are in one of those categories by choice or not. You know, infertility is very, very real. And a lot of people maybe don't have children, but are desperately longing to have children. I think it's just really important to remember not to judge people in either category, because they may not be in that category by choice. And there may be factors that put them in one category or the other that we have no idea about and may be very painful or sad for them. And just being a little more sensitive to that and being a little more aware of that, I think would serve people on both sides of the fence. And people often point to IVF or in vitro fertilization as an option for people who can't conceive naturally, but it's hardly a sure bet. And this is aside from the extent to which IVF is now under attack in the same states that are looking to remove basically every option for family planning at this point. Quote, the average success rates of IVF on the first attempt varies, but it's generally around 20 to 35%. The national average for women younger than 35 able to become pregnant by in vitro fertilization on the first try, meaning the first egg retrieval, is 55.1%. However, that number drops steadily as the woman ages. Also, IVF is not a financially viable option for many people. If you're pricing IVF at fertility clinics in the United States, expect to be quoted roughly $12,000 to $14,000 for one cycle. This, however, doesn't mean that you'll pay that figure and be done. There are parts of the IVF process, some required, some optional, that most clinics treat as add-ons to the base fee. Depending on your needs, a single IVF cycle can cost $30,000 or more. More often, the total bill will fall somewhere between $15,000 and $20,000. And while some people can get IVF covered through insurance, many cannot. Quote, insurance coverage for IVF generally depends on what coverage plan your employer has elected to offer. Where you live can also play a role. 19 states have laws that require employers to provide fertility benefits. However, which treatments must be covered and who qualifies for coverage is different from state to state. Also, small employers, often defined as companies with 50 or fewer employees, and self-insured employers are often exempt from these laws. And none of this is even talking about how physically and emotionally taxing these fertility treatments can be. As we mentioned earlier, more and more women are choosing to delay having children because of the huge impacts it will have on their careers. This is not in their heads, by the way. You can see a direct correlation between women having children and diminishing their earning potential or career options as compared to men who typically benefit from having children. And when you combine it with just how expensive it can be to raise that child, it makes total sense that people would need to wait until they're more established in their careers, have higher incomes, have more stable lives, have maybe paid down more debt in order to start the process. But when you're starting later, it's almost automatically going to be more difficult and therefore more costly. And when you look at just how much of a personal trial and challenge having children can be for people who want them and how much of an important identity not wanting them can be for others, you really start to see chapter five, the millennial dichotomy, dinks versus tradwives. When it comes to the cultural narrative around having children versus not having them, just as much as the child-free movement and the aforementioned dinks, which we'll explain in a second, have become their own phenomenon on social media and otherwise, so has the ultra-idealized view of what it means to be a parent and especially a mother. We've spoken in previous videos about how our generation, in part because we were really the first to grow up with social media as we know it, pioneered the concept of mommy blogging, family channels, and just generally putting an extreme premium on playing the role of being the perfect parent. So we'll talk about both of these extremes and the narratives they represent for millennials, but let's start by taking a look at the dinks. 
montage of couples who don't have kids and can't afford to go to Disneyland anytime they want. So for those who may be unaware, Dinks, aka dual income, no kid couples have turned into quite a large community on TikTok, filled with couples bragging about how great their child-free lives are. And in all transparency, I say this as a member of a Dink couple. There are also even the self-proclaimed Dinkwads or Dinks with a dog. Not beating those allegations either, I fear. Yes, indeed, that is a, a painting of my own dog that, to be fair, someone sent to me as a gift, but nonetheless. Oh, also a lot of people keep saying that this is a Westie. My dog is not a Westie. Um, my dog is a, a mutt. She's Maltese, Havanese, and Pomeranian. Um, her, unusual, her unusually Westie tilted looks are just an accident of genetic fate. But anyway, as it comes to content creation, just as much as there has been a movement of people glamorizing and idealizing the life with children, these are generally people who are glamorizing the life without them. Generally speaking, dinks are people for whom not having children doesn't come out of any real financial concerns, because as the name suggests, they usually both earn good salaries. And this is not to say that dual income no kid couples are morally bankrupt for not having kids. I obviously am one of them and I don't consider myself morally bankrupt. Morally questionable sometimes, but certainly not bankrupt. But so often the tone of self-proclaimed dinks can come across as kind of smug, honestly, because often there is a false conclusion being drawn that their choice not to have children is the reason that they have plenty of extra disposable income. Now, sure, they're technically saving money on childcare and other child-related costs by not having kids, but they're not representative of the average household in the US. It's not an exact metric, but dinks are typically identified as child-free couples making a combined $200,000 or more, according to Business Insider. And per the most recent census, the average American household income is $74,580. In many ways, privileged couples making the privileged choice to not have children and to luxuriate in their disposable income isn't any better or worse than any other aspirational lifestyle content. And again, I do fall into that category even if I don't necessarily make it the center of the content I create. It's important to remember that if you are coming into a relationship with two robust incomes, it's not your choice not to have children that's suddenly making you privileged. You were privileged to begin with. And I'm just personally of the opinion that centering really anything around having immense financial privilege in a situation where so many people are struggling and as we discussed, the child poverty rate more than doubled in two years feels a little tone deaf to me. But speaking of tone deaf, on the other side, we have the mommy bloggers, the largely millennial content creators who built their entire online identities around being an idealized version of a parent, usually a mother. A gender reveal party went terribly wrong. Why aren't gender reveals illegal? Okay, just kidding. You can reveal, listen, first of all, let's be clear about two things, one, the baby will reveal its gender when it's good and ready. How about that? Two, the arms race of parties, we gotta, we gotta tone it down. We have showers, we have gender reveals. We have, well, by the way, I said showers, that's bridal and baby showers. We got bachelorette trips, we got the weddings, we got the receptions, we got a sip and see, we got a sprinkle for the next kids. Like as Carrie Bradshaw once put it, wh when are we celebrating the single people? Those poor people are having to put themselves into credit card debt to celebrate. Like now everyone for every life choice gets like six parties. It's enough. If you wanna reveal a gender, do it at the shower. And even then. But in all seriousness, aside from the general phenomenon of every single milestone in a child's life and development being its own cause for not just celebration, but social media content. After taking off online around the early 2010s, gender reveal parties and videos have become ubiquitous in certain communities to the point where not having one could make a parent-to-be seem less than thrilled about the new public persona that comes with being a parent. As one mother wrote for HuffPo back in 2019, when the gender reveal question had first been broached, I brushed it off. It seemed like something I could avoid during my pregnancy, like soft cheeses and sushi. Then the calls came, asking if I had made up my mind about a gender reveal party since my ultrasound date was fast approaching. Was this one of those pregnancy protocol things I was supposed to do? I felt pressured to decide. 
And as I mentioned, many people, moms in particular, take the sharing and documenting and celebrating of every single aspect of their child's existence one step further. They're not just stay-at-home moms, but share content about their lives as stay-at-home moms, the most extreme embracing the trad wife moniker and spreading the gospel of embracing a place in the home, cooking, cleaning, taking on childcare duties, and generally being subservient to their husbands. I love to cook and clean, just, just don't tell the feminists. We are going to be raising our daughters to be homemakers and not career women. A man's home is his castle, so he should be treated as a king. Also, I'm gonna do one of my favorite things here and reference one of my own TikToks on the nonsense of the trad wife content. Here's the thing about the trad wife content on here that's always working to convince young women that marrying a wealthy man is their ticket to financial and personal security. Leaving aside the fact that unless they have an ironclad prenup, this leaves them incredibly vulnerable if the man ever decides to leave them for a newer and younger model. And leaving aside the fact that the trad wife worldview is also usually wrapped up with countless other noxious beliefs about gender roles. And even setting aside the fact that especially since wages haven't kept up with cost of living since roughly 1979, it's near impossible to find any salary that can support an entire family in an upper middle class lifestyle. What's most offensive to me about this is that the very premise is completely flawed. You don't become wealthy through marrying a wealthy man. You marry a wealthy man through already being wealthy. If you look statistically at the kinds of women that super high earning men marry in hetero partnerships, it's women who are themselves high earning. Women who are highly educated, highly career driven, and yes, also high earners. So even if the goal was just to marry a rich man as your retirement plan, you would still have to girl boss your way there, unfortunately. And since this video isn't about the trad wife movement, we're not even going to touch on the fact that the content creators pushing these agendas are themselves often contributing to their households financially, but that might be something to think about. The one pattern I see is once they have kids, they don't get the help that they expected from their partners. And then that leads to all sorts of feelings of inadequacy, not being a good mom, hopelessness, exhaustion, and wondering if it was worth it because not only are you taking care of one or two or three kids or whatever, you also have this man child <laughs> who's not helping, who's not pulling his weight. Uh, that's the pattern I've seen that a lot of these women are married to men who do not help, do not pull their weight around uh, the house. Even though having a child was the right choice for me, and I'm so glad I did it, I still understand why people choose not to. And I affirm the fact that there are plenty of people who, yeah, I don't think they'd enjoy it. And that's okay. That doesn't mean I think they'd be a bad parent if they chose to have one or have a child. But like, if it's not for you, it's not for you. And that's okay. It's a huge, huge life change. And we should not give people a hard time if they're like, I don't think this is for me. I just don't want to do it. That's totally fine. We are a generation that in many ways pioneered what it means to perform parenthood online and have made every aspect of having a child into an identity you are meant to display publicly. We also, even as much as the girl boss generation, because that's also what millennials are, have pushed for women to have more professional agency. We've also glamorized and supported content that has extremely traditional roles about what a woman's job should be in the home. You're not defined by your uterus. You're not defined, you know, if you don't have kids. You are not this bad person because you chose, you didn't choose motherhood. You are, we are as women, not less than because we opted for a different life. I, I think my life is stellar. I mean it. Like if I want to go to Toronto tomorrow and buy a pair of shoes I don't need, I can do that. If I want to fly to Africa next week and go on a safari, I can do that. Uh, I love the freedom to choose. I just wish that I didn't go through all of that sort of the pity. The pity is what bugs me. The women who were my age back in my late 20s and, and 30s who were like, oh, poor you, you're not a mom. Like, I just wish I didn't go through that. I love that it's more accepted these days. A lot more women are embracing it and it's something to aspire to. I wish that I had a role model like that. I wish that I had a woman in my life when I was growing up who was child free because like everybody was a mom. Uh, yeah, I, I just want women of today, young women of today to know and teenage girls to know that we are not a monolith. Not all women are exactly the same. You are not a bad person if you don't want kids. People who force you into that sort of lifestyle and thinking are the ones who need a reality check. They're the ones who need to mind their own business. And 
uh, like the, the whole world is your oyster. I talk to people still who dread going to family events because they know they're going to hear when are you going to have a baby? When are you guys getting pregnant? Um, or even at their weddings, they hear, okay, it's time you're married. Uh, which I can't believe. I mean, Lance and I just had our 29th wedding anniversary and we got those questions the day of our wedding. And it just, I'm gob gobsmacked that that's still happening 30 years later, <laughs> but apparently it is. Um, so I, I, I know that that pressure still exists. Um, and I'm sorry. I, I mean, I wish, I wish I could be like a little angel on everybody's shoulder to support them through those moments. I think that we've come a long way and I know that we have much further to go. Which brings us to chapter six. Motherhood, the impossible choice for women. Now, one thing I mentioned at the beginning of this video was how many parents who have children actually on some level regret making those choices. According to one study, between about five and 14% of parents expressed feelings of regret around having children. And like, listen, is that all of them? Obviously not, but like 14%, that's kind of a lot. And as I mentioned, there's an entire and very active subreddit on this very topic. Now, part of the reason that regret around having children is fairly uncommon to hear spoken about is obvious, right? Like that doesn't feel great to admit, especially when your children who generally speaking, you chose to bring into the world are around to hear it. But it is something that's very important to normalize, at least to understand that just because people aren't saying it doesn't mean they're not thinking it. And this is speculation, but I've often felt that one of the reasons why women in particular might be so dissatisfied with the reality of having children is because of how different the experience tends to be versus this ultra idealized experience that we're often shown in the media, pop culture, and on our social feeds. We still have a very specific representation of motherhood that is based on the kind of single income household that we mentioned earlier, which really hasn't existed since the late 1960s. As we've talked about before in our episode of TFC with Eve Rodsky, the author of Fair Play, women, even working women, and most women do have to work to help support their households, are expected to take on the vast majority of the child rearing and domestic burden, which sure used to be the case, but not on top of also having a job. Even for people, especially women who may love the abstraction of having children and love their children as people, are very likely to not love the experience of what it means to be a mother in America. And this extreme focus on the retrograde and no longer super accurate picture of what it means to be a parent is likely fueling the pretty strong backlash that a lot of people are demonstrating toward the concept of having children at all. As someone who strongly embraces a child-free by choice lifestyle, often where I feel most out of step with the community is the very vocal minority that's basically antinatalist. You don't have to look very hard on a lot of child-free communities and forums to see people really openly expressing hating children, hating parents, and hating the entire concept of parenthood. Now, I'm not gonna get into a political or ecological debate about the antinatalism movement, although I definitely don't align with it, but I will say that when it comes to the very extreme negative emotions you often see in the child-free community when it comes to parents and children, although it can be unpleasant to read, especially I would imagine if you do have kids, to me it often feels more like a response to the types of roles that we're still expecting people, again, especially women, to fit into. We still very much impose this belief that being a mother is the most important thing you can be, as a woman, that having children is the ultimate purpose and only thing really worth celebrating in a person's life after a certain point. Again, let's go back to the normalization of basically only ever seeing a person's children on social media once they have them. And being so insistent on everyone's path being parenthood that even parents themselves who might regret it are shamed and ostracized if they dare speak about it. It's not totally shocking that there would be a strong negative reaction to that kind of paradigm, especially again in a society where we make it nearly impossible for people to afford children. Ultimately, as a millennial who made the choice that having children was not right for me, I feel very privileged that this was a choice I was able to come to 
organically and in a healthy way. Although it's led to some uncomfortable and unpleasant conversations in my life, overall, it wasn't a situation where I was extraordinarily stigmatized or ostracized because of it. And I do want to acknowledge that for a lot of people in a lot of different cultures and family situations, not having children can have much more extreme consequences. But I do still very much feel the pressures of being a woman in a society that expects me as a default to have children and then has to be walked backwards from that point into the fact that I don't. I've had many an Uber driver, for example, ask me if I have children and then say, no, I don't want children, um, try to pitch me on the concept during a 30 minute drive. And I don't mind this because I understand that for many, if not most people, having children is the most wonderful thing that they've done in their lives. It's a kind of experience and love that I'll never personally be able to relate to. It's also worth noting that it's almost always men who are pushing this, often like women who have children when they hear that I'm like, I very much don't want them, they'll be like, God bless you. <laughs> Sometimes they'll be like, I don't either. <laughs> don't tell my kids that. <laughs> but the point is, although I come from a very privileged place in this decision, I'm still very aware that it's a decision the world doesn't necessarily necessarily want me to make. And yet, on the flip side, it's a decision that our society makes impossibly hard on many of the people who want to make it. Like so much in our current economic situation, there are almost no good choices. But I strongly believe one thing. If we were to make it a more value-neutral decision that people could actively opt into, children would have better parents. And if we made it easier on parents, especially new mothers, to actually raise their children, we would have much happier families. As always, guys, thanks for watching, and I'll see you back next month for our newest video essay.